for those that have not been um, with us on Sunday, we kicked off the year talking about the instruction that God gave us to ultimately receive everything he has for us. And that instruction was to be humble. We talked about how the word instructs us to, it tells us that those who humble themselves will be exalted and those who exalt themselves will be humble, right? Last Sunday, I taught on the necessity of us to prioritize intentional love. And all of this, like God is revealing to me the posture that we should have as believers. And so humility, love, and today we're going to get into commitment. And as it relates to commitment, I want us to take a look at the book of Acts, because I've been heavy in Acts for the last few days. And he's been revealing some things. And so in the book of Acts, this is, uh, I'm looking at chapter 20. And I'm going to start at chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 20, verse 18. And while you're finding that, this is Paul speaking. And this is towards the end of his, his ministry. He's traveled all over sharing the good news to everyone who will listen. And even those that don't want to listen, he's still sharing the good news. Repent. Turn from your evil ways, follow Christ, believe in him. And he's caught backlash. Some people believe, some people don't. Some people plotted to kill him just for doing what God had called him to do, what God had instructed him to do. People literally were threatening his life. And so at this point in the text, he's speaking to, he, he summoned some of the people, some of the elders from the church of Ephesus, and he had this word for them. And this is where we pick up in Acts 20, verse 18. When they arrived, these are the people from Ephesus. When they arrived, he declared, you know that from the day I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear either publicly or in your homes. I have had one message for the Jews and Gentiles alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. Verse 22, and now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. That's nothing to look forward to, but it's purpose. The Holy Spirit tells me in city to, city to city that jail and suffering lie ahead. Verse 24, but my life, if there's nothing else y'all write down tonight or highlight, highlight this part. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And now I know that none of you whom I have pre none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. So he was had a feeling that he was near the end. I know that you'll never see me again. I declare today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, i.e. goes to hell, it's not my fault. For I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. So we're talking about tonight, the topic for your notes is finish the work. Finish the work. Now, the attributes of the believer, like I said before, God has been highlighting that in very plain terms to start this year. Humility, love, and now commitment in finishing the work. And when it comes to finishing the work, first thing you have to understand is what your assignment is. So tonight we're going to reflect and, and converse about assignment. What is your assignment? So start thinking about that as I'm going through this word. What is your assignment? Because we all have one. And Paul reflects on his assignment when he initially shared 
about the encounter he had with Jesus on the road to Damascus. So he was sharing um, in Acts 22. It says, Acts 22 and 14. It says, then he told me, this is him referring to Ananias. So let me, let me back up. So for those, and, and, and let me just give a plug to the, the Bible. Amazing book. Read that entire thing, right? Um, and I, I recommend starting in the New Covenant, so the New Testament, and reading that through, and then going back and reading the Old Testament because it gives you context of Jesus as you're reading the Old Testament. And so when, when Paul... And, and I feel like Paul is the person that I would identify the most with in the word because he went through a radical transformation. And so long story short, he was on the way to Damascus to persecute and kill Christians. En route, Jesus encountered him, blinded him, and then instructed him to go. So when he blinded him, Paul is like, who are you, Lord? He knew he had encountered God. Who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Then he said, what do you want me to do? So at that point, he acknowledged Jesus as Lord, and then he surrendered and said, what do you want me to do? So he waited for instruction. Jesus told him to go to Damascus and wait for further instruction. All right. Then he went, Jesus goes to Ananias, shows up to Ananias in a vision and says, Ananias, I need you to go to Straight Street. That was the name of the street. He was on Straight Street and go see a man named Saul from Tarsus. He's praying to me right now, and I have shown him a man named Ananias come in to lay hands on him so that he receives his vision. Ananias is like, Jesus, I love you, but you're tripping. This is the same dude that has been terrorizing Christians. He even has authorization to come and take even more of us back captive. Jesus' instruction to Ananias, even after he complained about not wanting to fulfill his assignment, which we typically do, Jesus' instruction was, go. Let me deal with, I'm paraphrasing, let me deal with Saul and the suffering he must endure for my namesake. So Ananias goes, lays hands on Paul, Saul in the text, but who we refer to as Paul. He received his vision and then received the Holy Spirit. So this is Paul telling this story, recounting this story. So Acts 22, 14. Then he told me, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and hear him speak. This is Paul recounting what Ananias told him. So Ananias was used to reveal to Paul what his assignment was. I want to pause because God will use people to reveal to you what your assignment is. And the way that you can recognize that that person is from God is that he will reveal it to you first. He revealed to Paul while he was praying that Ananias would come and lay hands on him. Therefore, when Ananias came, he could recognize that this was something from God. When people tell you I have a word from God for you, the best way to know that that word is true is for you to already have received it from God himself. The best way for you to recognize that a word is from God is for you to be in his word. So like if we're not in our Bibles, if we're not spending time with God, we can be susceptible to what anybody says and then find ourselves jumping from purpose to purpose or assignment to assignment and not pursuing the thing that God has called us to do. Right. Hey, Tiffany, see you back there. Snuck in. Make sure y'all get some pizza. Is there any pizza left? OK, get some pizza if y'all haven't already. Some over there. Um, and so when you don't have the word from God, when you don't have the confirmation for yourself, you can find yourself jumping all over the place. And so this is what, what Paul is, is recounting. He said in verse 15, for you are to be his witness, telling everyone what you have seen and heard. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. After I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple and fell into a trance. This is Paul talking. I saw a vision of Jesus saying to me, hurry, leave Jerusalem, for the people here won't accept your testimony about me. But Lord, I argued. Another argument. You're going to see a common theme when God tells people to do something. The first thing we do is, but Lord. But Lord, I don't know. Moses even, I can't even speak. But Lord, we start justifying why we can't do what God has called us to do. 
We start making excuses as to why we're not suitable to do the thing that he preordained us to do. And we talk ourselves out of ultimately fulfilling the thing that God has already set up for us to win at. By telling ourselves we're not worthy. I'm going to keep going. But Lord, I argued, they certainly know that in every synagogue I, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And I was in complete agreement when your witness, Stephen, was killed. I stood by and kept the coats they, were, they took off when they stoned him. 21. But the Lord said to me, go. <laughs> For I will send you far away to the Gentiles. All right. So what's your assignment? What God showed me in this text was that we can find our assignment if we revisit the place we, where he first encountered us. So think back to your first encounter with Jesus. Not church, not religion, not judgment, not condemnation. Your first encounter with Jesus. And the text tells us that as we reflect back on that first encounter, there are clues that point to what our assignment is. My first real encounter with Jesus came to me when, like right after I had crashed my car into a building from drinking and driving. I went home. I was living in L.A. Nobody came to bail me out, right? Right? I had to call, I, I, I'm calling everybody I know. And for, by the grace of God, they let me keep my phone long enough to get the important numbers out. So I'm calling everybody I know in LA. Nobody's answering, nobody's responding, nobody's coming. So I had to call my sister who was in Virginia and have her call a bail bondsman on three-way to figure out a situation to get me out of jail because this ain't somewhere I'm trying to stay. I get home. My roommate at the time says, oh, man, you just need another beer. I just got locked up from drinking and driving. I blew a .203. For those that aren't familiar with the, the system, that's like three times the legal limit. And the first thing this dude says is, you need another beer. I said, you know, there are certain things that I need. I don't think a beer is one of them. And at that time, I, I started to evaluate where I was in life and how all of my decisions had led me to this point. So I didn't know at that time I needed to surrender to Jesus, but I knew I didn't need to surrender to beer. So I said, I'm not drinking anymore. I'm not going to drink and drive anymore. I'll never forget. I had, it was as clear as day. The voice said, drinking is not the problem. Lust is. You just use alcohol as a means to numb yourself to my voice so you can pretend that I'm not here. And then I'm like, okay, um, had that Saul moment, what do I do? Because all I know after work is drinking and partying and hanging out. It's LA, the best nights to party or every night. Sunday is the best night. And I, I, I never forget, I had started going to one LA when they were located in North Hollywood the church moved away from where I used to be able to walk to, and they moved to the middle of like West Hollywood off of Melrose. So me and my stubbornness at the time, because I was only going like, you know, periodically, I wasn't, you know, really dedicated to walking with God. When the church moved, I said, fine, I'm not going anymore. Cool. I tried, but church move, I guess it ain't meant to be. After that accident, I realized that when I left work and had to get home, I drove past the new location every day. And this one particular day, it was a Wednesday, it was midweek service. I, I remember driving past and seeing the marquee open like for, for midweek service. And I go in and it was the most freeing, peaceful, fulfilling experience I had ever had in a church. And the people were people that I could relate to. And, the, and the, the message spoke directly to me. And I remember in that period of my life, Pastor Torre shouts out to him. He said, you know, remember what attracted you to Jesus. As it relates to your calling, as it relates to your destiny, remember what attracted you to Jesus and then become that. 
So that stuck with me. I still haven't hadn't at this point fully dedicated my life and, and, and started fresh. But those words, remember what attracted you to Jesus and become that for other people, stuck with me. And so from there, I remember surrendering everything and, and fully walking with, with God and then being in this place, right? What's your purpose? I used to hate when people asked me, what's your purpose? Because I always associated purpose with money. And if I can't make money doing it, it ain't purpose. And so I always got frustrated. But now when people would ask me that question, I would remember those words. Remember what attracted you to Jesus and become that. So I'm like, all right, cool. I'm just going to, I'm joining the men's ministry. Like I, I, I'm, I'm, what attracted me to Jesus in that movement was the authenticity of, of, of the leadership and how the word was shared, and it was non-judgmental, and it was welcoming, and everybody was, was able to show up as they are, right? And Jesus moved, and people's lives were transformed, and I loved just the authentic nature of the ministry. So I'm like, man, what I love most about Jesus is the authenticity. Our preacher just admitted that he had a sex problem, and he had to surrender that to God. I got a sex problem now. So if I can see that he's able to be where he is, even having suffered through some of the same things I'm suffering through now, there's hope for me. And if he can be authentic in who he is, I can be authentic in who I am. And so think again, think back to the first encounter you had with Jesus. It might not have been pretty. But, you know, for a fact, it was Jesus. It might not have been something that, you know, I don't, it, it might have been trauma that he pulled you out of. I don't want you to live in the trauma. Just think back to the encounter with him. It could have been his, his humility. It could have been his loving nature. It could have been the authenticity like it was for me. It could have been the, the, the servant, right? It could have been the, the, the peacemaker. Whatever it is, remember what attracted you to Jesus and then, and then become that. So, um, the other thing is what happened. So just to, to, to give you all the full story, cause we, we talk on Wednesday nights. I just started serving. My safe place was in the house of God. I didn't trust myself outside of the church, right? I hardly trust myself inside of the church. There's a whole lot of pretty girls there. I had to have accountability. I had to have my guys with me. Like, you know, I'm not going on dates because I'm not, I'm not ready yet. I'm, I'm trying to stay on the straight and narrow. And I just kept serving. What do you need? You need security? Bet, I'm doing security. What do you need? You need somebody reading the announcements? I'm there. You need somebody holding doors, being a, a, you know, a gatekeeper? Like, I'm there. Whatever I needed to do, that's what I did to make sure that I was in alignment, right? And then what ended up happening is what's going to happen for each of you. As you continue to just take one step in the assignment and you do it in humility, which we've been talking about, God's going to give you more. And he's going to, over time, start to elevate you and start to exalt you. And as you continue to serve in humility, there will be other opportunities. So it went from me serving, security, reading announcements. One day I got a call from PT. He's like, hey, are you able to officiate service on, on Sunday? And I'm like, what does that mean? Like actually be on stage? You know what I mean? Like, cause that ain't what I, I'm here for. And then I remember I had a vision probably a week prior to that of me standing on stage, speaking about the attack of our worship. You know I tell you that? I was like, why am I on stage and why am I talking to people about worship? Like there's an attack on your worship. You need to really allow yourself to fight through the, the, the resistance to really allow that encounter to happen through your worship. And when he asked me to officiate, I'm like, all right, cool, yeah, I'll do it. What do I need to do? Just introduce the speaker and, and all that? He was like, yeah, cool. Fam, I get on stage after the worship team finishes, and I'm about to introduce the speaker, and then the words just started flowing. There's an attack on your worship. There's an attack on your worship. You need to be fight past the distractions, fight past the frustration, fight past anything that's prohibiting you from really receiving and having this moment with God. There is an attack on your worship. And I almost lost my mind 
because I'm speaking the vision that I had heard and I'm new to the, this walk, but I'm literally speaking and it's just coming to me because it's like I'm already speaking what has happened. And so this thing about God revealing himself to you through visions is real. And so I spoke about um, us living in the prophetic and, and having a prophetic state of mind uh, recently because God is still speaking through dreams, through visions. And as you cultivate your environments to receive from him, you're in your word, you're praying, you're, you're, you're mindful of your, what you're taking in visually and, and audibly, and you're really setting your environment up to hear from him, he will speak to you. And in that speaking is an assignment. And as you take on that assignment, he will continue to give you more assignments. I could have said, PT, no, I'm not doing that. That's not what I do. Just let me stand and be security. I've been in the, in the gym. But I said, okay. And then that thing just continued to unfold. And then ultimately, my wife, we're sitting in the um, in the pews, not pews, we're sitting in the audience, pews, that's Baptist church talk. A flyer comes up about women's ministry. I'm like, hey, babe, you should do that. You should go and, you know, help them start that. And so she's like, all right, she prayed on it, and then she started leading the, the women's ministry. So now here she is leading the women's ministry. I joined the men's ministry. Next thing I know, the leader at the time, shouts out to Pierre, there's another one of my brothers. He's like, he looks at me, I'm brand new to the ministry. He looks at me, he was like, hey, man, you, you look like you have a word for next week. I said, a word for what? He was like, no, nah, you got it. I'm like, all right. So that next week, I think I got the video somewhere. I have a Bible. I have a journal. I got, like, all types of notes. And I'm just up there just fumbling through, just trying to, you know, get through it. But I got some of the best feedback that night from people that were in seminary, from people that had been, like, you know, raised in the church, they were like, dude, I can see you actually speaking on Wednesdays. I can see you actually leading and, and giving sermons. And I'm like, I don't know what y'all see. I just said yes to, you know, my man saying that I could give the word. And then I was overwhelmed. I started crying, not knowing, because I'm not the crying type of dude. And I'm just crying in this place. And they're praying over me. I had no idea that four years later, no, 19, five, six years later, that my wife and I would be getting ordained as pastors on my birthday in that same very church. But it all started with saying yes to the assignment. So again, what is your assignment? There are clues in where you first encountered Jesus. Amen? Last thing I'll say is this. So the text revealed to me that we, we can oftentimes find confirmation in where we first encountered Jesus. It also revealed to me that we will do our best to talk ourselves out of the assignment. We will do our best to talk ourselves out of the assignment because if it's a God, if it's a God assignment or a God instruction, it is bigger than what you think you're capable of. And it's supposed to be. I've said it before, if you can do it and you can draw it out and see how it starts and how it ends, it's a you vision, it's not a God vision. And so we will typically talk ourselves out of things that make us uncomfortable because we can't see how it can happen in our own power. And the last thing that was revealed to, to me in this, in this uh, scripture, even as we try to talk ourselves out of it, when it's a God assignment, it won't leave you alone. You will still hear that word, okay, cool, you don't think you're good enough? Okay, go. Still go. And if you don't go, you're robbing yourself of an opportunity for God to use you in magnificent ways. If Ananias didn't go and, and do what he needed to do with, with Saul, Jesus could have used somebody else. But Ananias would have been robbed of an opportunity to be used in a way that transformed the life of one of the most iconic believers in history. So the things that God has told you to do is telling you to do. It's supposed to be bigger than you. It's supposed to feel like you can't do it because in your own power, you can't. You need the Holy Spirit to do what he's called you to do. 
And so when you hear the instruction, when you hear the assignment, when it's revealed to you, just go. Because the attributes of a true believer are that we're humble, that we live with intentional love, and that we do the work. And we're committed to it. Amen? So questions to get the conversation popped off. What is your assignment? What is your assignment? Question two, are you committed to it or are you in the process of talking yourself out of it? And lastly, how's that working for you? I'm going to welcome my wife up here to join me. Um, so I want to also encourage those that if you know your, call, your, your talent, your gift, your, your calling, right? Because everyone's calling is to share the love of Jesus, share what Jesus has done in your life. And your respective talents is the avenue in which you can do that. But don't allow the expectation of what you think the outcome or the steps needed to make it happen, um, that you don't meet those requirements. Because if you're, if you're projecting, okay, I have to do this X, Y, Z, and I'm not gonna have X, Y, Z because I need A, B, C, then you're gonna procrastinate those steps to take to do what God called you to do. And to say this better plainly, uh, I had been sitting on a song, what was like seven years? One song. And I'm so spoiled in my, career, in my previous career that I'm used to having studio time. I'm used to the expectation is you need to have a, you know, your EPK, at least six songs minimum, and then you can release everything at once because the audience, people are going to want more. This is in the world, the carnal world. Things die quickly in the carnal world, but things produced in life last. They don't die. So all it takes is just one thing, one song, one call, one call whatever it is. So I had been sitting on this song for seven years because I thought I need more songs. I can't just release one song. People are going to want more. And I would literally go through this internal war of like, I, I don't even want to sing anymore. I don't have enough. I, the song's not mixed. I don't have the instrumentations on it. I, I'm, I'm talking myself out of it. And he would play it for me randomly. And I would start crying. Like, why are you playing me this song? It's not even mixed. You know, I'm talking about British. I'm like, it's not mixed. It's not going to sound right. It's not going to translate. But then God had reminded me, when it's a God thing, like you said, there's power behind it. So God can use one thing that will last a lifetime, especially in the music industry, that the songs that you need to keep producing songs because they're not produced from life. They're produced from just like dead seeds, so they die quickly. But something that God is doing in you, and I use music, it is, it's, there's a life, so it will live. And so I eventually, after seven years, released a song as it was. I'm like, okay, babe, let's just do it. We got someone to mix it for us. Shout out to, Shout out to Brian Kennedy. <coughs> and the testimonies that are coming from this one song, this one song, and it's not even about, it's, it's not millions of people haven't heard it. It's not making me money but it's setting captives free. And so you can't look at whatever you're producing from a carnal standpoint. It's about setting souls free. Because what whoever you're called to, people are gonna see themselves in you. And your gift is just an avenue to introduce what Jesus has done in your life. Because our calling, we can't speak about, we can't speak about, oh, well, Jesus delivered Paul. Like, they don't know Paul, but they know you. Jesus healed me from my anxiety. He healed me from my abusive past, and he can do that for you. And, then, and that's what it is to spread the gospels. What is Jesus doing in your life right now? Amen. Don't pull up scripture. They don't know that. They haven't read the Bible, but they've seen you handle situations. So putting Jesus on when the Bible says to put on Christ, like the armor, put him on, and then use your, your charisma, your gifts, your friends to just constantly share and people are seeing and people are hungry so whatever it is don't let it let the what you expect the outcome to look like keep you from just doing it who cares about if it's gonna make you money or not 
Jesus, there's a life attached to what God produces.